Now, for my assigned topic tonight, I'm taking my cues from what I know is your all of your favorite document, the dreaded seventh grade social studies teaks, right? Now, when I consulted those, here are some of the things uh, of interest that I found. Um, Students will identify the role of the U.S. free enterprise system and understand that this system may be referenced as capitalism or the free market system. Uh, students will identify significant individuals, events, and issues, including the effects of the growth of railroads and the contributions of James Hogg, explain the political, economic, and social impact of the agricultural industry, describe and compare the impact of reform movements in Texas, explain the impact of economic concepts within the free enterprise system, such as supply and demand, profit, and world competition on the economy of Texas. Well, there you go. So in light of the TEKS and especially their emphasis on teaching our kids about capitalism and the free enterprise system, I wanna start by posing what I think is the essential question for tonight. Uh, and that is, how did capitalism, also known as the U.S. free enterprise system, lead Texas farmers into the political reform movement known as populism? In other words, what's the relationship between capitalism on one hand and political populism on the other? Now, as a starting place, I, I want to set the stage for what was happening to the American economy in the years after the Civil War. If there's one thing that we as Texas history teachers should always remember, it's that events in Texas rarely happen in a vacuum. Uh, although we proud Texans like to think that Texas is a world unto itself, that it's exceptional in every way, history really tells us otherwise. Certainly by the last third of the 19th century, Texas was an integral part, not just of the American national economy, but really of the global economy. Decisions made in Washington or on Wall Street or in places like Liverpool or Manchester or even Egypt and India directly affected the lives of ordinary Texans every day. And the reality was that the world was undergoing rapid wrenching changes. The Industrial Revolution had entered a new phase by the mid 1800s with the rise of large scale industrial capitalism. That revolution was driven by the mechanization of the cotton textile industry, uh, which remained important all the way through the 19th century, but by the 1870s, it had spread to industries such as railroads, steel, oil, chemicals, and all manner of, of manufacturing. There we go. Uh, the new industrial order was made possible by the creation of the modern corporation. Now we think of corporations as sort of the epitome of the free enterprise system. But in reality, corporations by definition are cre creations and really creatures of the state. I mean, what is a corporation anyway? It's, it's a company that's granted a charter or, or licensed to do business by a government, usually a state government. And that license gives it special privileges, primarily the priv privilege of selling stock to investors who are then granted limited liability for the corporation's debts. Now understand that this may make your eyes glaze over a little bit talking about the fine points of, of what a corporation is. And it certainly can make seventh graders eyes glaze over, but it's tremendously important, okay? Uh, and, I, and I guess I've got three major points I think students need to know about the American corporation. First, students need to understand that corporations, as, as I just said, are created by law. Laws that allow them to grow very large because they, they can have thousands of, of investors and that allow them to operate in ways that give the owners and managers of the corporation a great deal of protection uh, from any adverse consequences of their actions. Under limited liability, stockholders may lose their initial investment if the company goes under, but they are not responsible for the company's debts. The company's executives may draw a fat paycheck, but if the corporation goes broke, they walk away unscathed. 
A second important thing to understand about the modern corporation is that while we think about competition being the essence of capitalism, uh, the reality was that corporations hated, cap hated competition. As a result, they often colluded with one another to limit competition. The more successful corporations tended to take over the less successful ones. Standard Oil, of course, is famous for that. With the result that most of the nation's biggest industries were effectively monopolized, owned, or at least controlled by one big company. Standard Oil, U.S. Steel, the J.P. Morgan Banking Interest, the J. Gould Railroad Network. The, the list is a long one. And in an era before any limits on campaign donations, these companies wielded great political influence. Uh, and and y'all may be familiar with this very famous cartoon from the late 19th century titled Boss, Bosses of the Senate in it. And it shows the, the fat cats of the trusts and monopolies. I don't know if you can read the, the labels on them, but the, you've got the steel beam trust, the copper trust, the standard oil trust, and, and so on. And so the sugar trust and so forth. And, and they are looming over the, the, uh, the, the, the members of the U.S. Senate, giving them their orders, right? Um, the third important thing to remember about the new corporate order is that these mammoth new monopolistic corporations had enormous power to hire and fire workers and to pay them whatever they wanted. But an individual worker had almost no bargaining power. The consequence was that wages for working people remain desperately low, while the prices charged by monopolized industries for their products remained high. Uh, and, and of course, the, of the many abuses of, the, of that system, of course, was the, the rampant use of child labor. Now, you may say, wait, Texas was mainly an agricultural state. It's supposed to be about cotton, true. But agriculture was by no means insulated from these developments. Cotton was still the foundation of the Texas economy in the 1870s and 80s and 90s, really, really dwarfing the, we think about the, 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 the cat, the, this is the era of the cattle kingdom, the great OA cattle drive and so forth. Cotton always uh, dwarfed cattle in economic importance by almost virtually every measure in late 19th century Texas. Uh, but to be a Texas cotton farmer was to be caught up in, as I've already said, the national and international economy. Farmers needed capital, meaning money, money for investment, in order to operate. After all, farmers had to live all year while their crops are growing. They only get paid at the end of the year at harvest time. Then the prices that they receive for their crops is dependent upon worldwide supply and demand, which in turn is uh, off, uh, often the decisions that drive that are often made in, in corporate boardrooms in places like New York, Chicago, or London, or Paris, or wherever. As the European imperial powers colonized places like Egypt and India, vast new sources of raw cotton flooded onto world markets, further de destabilizing prices. And then in the meantime, farmers also needed modern mechanized equipment. They needed better seed, more effective fertilizers. These goods had to be transported to customers by railroad or steamship, and harvested crops had to be transported to distant markets. So the farmers are, are not living some sort of romantic life in the rural countryside. They are part of the world market economy. Again, we like to think of the late 19th century as an era of unfettered free enterprise and, and the, the good people in the state legislature who approved the Teeks, I think many of them probably think of it that way. But the American free enterprise was never really all, its system was never really all that free. Take for example, banking. As we've said, farmers always need credit, then and now, it's in the very nature of farming. But the federal government, with its power to charter corporations, including banks, made the playing field a very unlevel one for farmers. Without going into painful details, we'll just say that in the, in the Civil War era, the federal government, or during the Civil War, the federal government established a national banking system 
that heavily favored large Wall Street banks like JP Morgan. Uh, and I'll give you just one major example of how those favors work, and it's one that is important to our, to our story today. During the Civil War, to finance the war effort, the U.S. government went off the gold standard, printing paper money not backed up by gold or silver, uh, paper money known as greenbacks because of the color of the ink that was used on the back side of them. And this resulted in, in a great expansion of the money side. It really allowed the federal government to win the Civil War in a lot of ways. But in 1875, under heavy pressure from Wall Street bankers, Congress passed the Specie Resumption Act, uh, which ended the nation's experiment with paper money, with the greenbacks. And over the next few four years, the nation went back on the gold standard for all practical purposes. As the nation's paper money supply, as these greenbacks, was taken out of circulation and, and redeemed in gold, the amount of money in circulation shrank dramatically. Uh, when there's less supply of something valuable in an economy, in this case, money, money's valuable, the price of that thing always rises. And we have a name for the price of money, right? It's called interest. So, by a direct action of the federal government in the 1870s, the Wall Street bankers who already had a lot of money got richer and richer, and anyone who wanted to borrow that money had to pay a lot more for it in the form of skyrocketing interest rates. And as again, farmers are big borrowers. Now, let's segue to Texas. Uh, oops. Got ahead of myself there. The state was experiencing explosive population growth in the last third of the 19th century. And I think, I think sometimes this maybe gets overlooked in our Texas history classes. But look at these, look at these four charts. They show the pop, Texas population, 1870, 1880, 1890, and 1900. And look at the explosive growth. Almost quadrupling. Uh, population in those 30 years. And here's another look at it uh, in terms of percentage change. In that one decade of the 1870s, the population grows by 95%. And overall, in the 30-year period, the percentage change is 372%. Where were all these new Texas, including my great-grandparents, coming from? Well, they were almost all coming from places in the South further East, the old, the old Lower South or the old Upper South. Uh, how did they get here? Well, they came on the expanding Texas network of railroads. And you can see here the before and after pictures from 1870 and, 18, and 1890. Just in that 20 year period, you see the remarkable expansion of Texas railroad connection tying together all of the really the, the cotton raising and, and, and agricultural parts of the eastern half of Texas. It's the settled parts of Texas. And although this map doesn't show it, those connections enabled Texas to be connected by rail to all the, the major population centers of the east and north. Um, this massive population growth meant several things. First of all, demand for land skyrocketed, meaning that land prices rose. Uh, here's another set of figures, uh, in some ways even more staggering than the population figures. This is a number of acres of Texas land planted in cotton in these four, uh, these at, at the beginning of the three decade period and at the end, growing even faster than the population. Uh, All of these new Texas cotton farmers are now in competition with all those other new cotton farmers in India and Egypt and Brazil and other places. And this guaranteed that cotton prices would remain low, even though production was exploding worldwide. This next chart, then probably the most important one in my, in my uh, presentation, uh, reveals very starkly what Texas cotton, cotton farmers were facing then as the century wore on. And all you got to do is just, just kind of glance at this chart. 
from 16 cents a pound. This is this is the per pound uh, price for cotton from 16 cents a pound in 1869. There is a steady drip, drip, drip of downward crop prices to the point that at, at the low point in the mid 1890s, Texas uh, cotton farmers were receiving on average about a nickel a pound for their cotton crop. And it's very important to note that at a nickel a pound, even the most efficient farmers, the most scientific modern farmers could scarcely break even. Um, so farmers were like a man on a treadmill running faster and faster and getting tireder and tireder and falling farther and farther behind. Now, remember what we said about farmers and their need for credit. Uh, they had to have credit at the beginning of the, of the crop year, but banks, for the most part, would not loan money to farmers unless they were willing to mortgage their farms to borrow the land. It was a matter of policy. You just didn't loan farmer. You didn't make bank loans to farmers. So where could farmers turn? Well, where they turned was to a local businessman called a furnishing merchant. Uh, sometimes called a credit merchant. So what was a furnishing merchant? Well, that was just a fancy name for a rural general store owner who would sell or furnish goods on credit to local farmers. Often these stores located just at a rural crossroads in the middle of some farming region or in a, or in a small farming town. Uh, so at the beginning of the, uh, the, the, the idea was that the, this store owner would sell or furnish goods on credit to local farmers. So at the beginning of the growing season, a farmer would come to his local furnishing merchant, purchase seed, supplies, maybe a horse or a mule or a wagon, food and clothing for his family. And the merchant would, first thing the merchant would ask him, cash or credit. For those paying cash, there was usually one set of prices. For those needing uh, credit, which is most farmers, certainly vir virtually, virtually, virtually all poor farmers, there was a second much higher set of prices. The prices were not often not stated and the interest rate was rarely specified. But when all was said and done, the actual interest rate on an annual basis uh, for goods purchased on credit from a furnishing merchant was often 20, 25, 30%, sometimes even 40 or 50% annual interest. You think your credit cards are ripping you off. So the farmer gets his goods, he raises his crops, and then remember, remember our, uh, our uh, chart of, of prices. In the, in, the end, in the meantime, prices for cotton have fallen. And when the farmer sells his crop, he can't pay the merchant what he owes. So what does he do? Well, if he owns his own land, maybe he eventually has to mortgage it to pay his debts. But if this goes on, but that just creates a new debt. And if this goes on for a few more years, what's likely to happen? Well, you guessed it. Eventually, if the farmer has mortgaged his land and he can't pay off the, the can't pay the note, he, the farm gets foreclosed upon. Uh, when the farmer loses his land, what does he do? Well, now he has to become a renter, and he has to he has to farm land that he doesn't own. And since most poor farmers couldn't afford couldn't afford to pay cash rent for reasons that we've already discussed. Their only choice is to promise the landlord a share of the crop, and this is called sharecropping. In the meantime, the farmer is still having to be furnished each year by the furnishing merchant, and each year he falls further and further into debt to the merchant. In fact, to make sure that he gets paid, the merchant, who was in reality often also the landlord, would often require that the farmer actually mortgage the crop in the, growing in the field. This was called the crop lien, L-I-E-N. The crop is collateral for the debts that will be paid back, presumably at the end of the year. So the merchant in that scenario, in the, in the crop lien system, the merchant actually owned a portion of the crop, even if, as it was being grown in the field. 
you can see, I think, where all this is headed. By the late 1880s, Texas farmers were desperate. Their resentment against merchants, bankers, manufacturers, and railroads was reaching the boiling point. But it went against Texan and American tradition to, to seek help for your problems from the government, particularly Southerners who had been raised to be suspicious of, especially the federal government in Washington, uh, were committed to the idea of self-help. And in the 1870s, Texas farmers established an organization, a self-help organization uh, called the Farmers Alliance. In the 1880s, the Alliance uh, experienced explosive growth. Its solution, the, the Alliance, the local uh, alliances would, would hold meetings of their members, men and women could both be members, and they would have lecturers give educational talks about how to be a better farmer. But the Alliance's main solution to the farmers' problems was to create local farmers' cooperatives farmer-owned gins, mills, and marketing arrangements that would um, bypass the furnishing merchants and get better crops for farmers' crops by, help, by, by, by allowing the farmers to market their crops collectively in bulk. The cooperative movement uh, sponsored by the Farmers Alliance spread across the state in the 1880s. Oops. And here, if I can get there, here is a, uh, a map that, that I made up of uh, Farmers Alliance local cooperatives, the ones that I was able to learn about in the 1880s and 90s. And you can see that they were scattered all over the eastern half of Texas. Um, unfortunately for farmers the alliance the, the alliance cooperative movement was short-lived the cooperatives soon failed turns out that the co cooperatives themselves needed credit and banks and wholesale merchants wouldn't do business with them in desperation the farmers turned to the only institution they could control and that was the government by means of their votes at the state level in 1886, the Farmers Alliance supported for Attorney General a professed reformer, James Stephen Hogg. Hogg ran for Attorney General on a platform promising to create a railroad commission to regulate the sky-high prices charged by the railroads, which was a major complaint of Texas farmers. In 1890, with heavy alliance support, Hogg was elected governor. He kept his promise and did create the Railroad Commission, but it soon proved ineffective and was ruled unconstitutional by the Texas Supreme Court. Hogg also angered farmers by not appointing a member of the alliance to the, to the three-man uh, commission. At the national level, the alliance ha then hammered out a series of political demands. And here are the, 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 it was a long list, but here were their major demands. First, they demanded a, a, the creation of a national currency. Uh, in other words, paper money, the old greenbacks, issued directly by the federal government, not money not backed up by gold and silver. This takes the country off the gold standard and, create, and, and, and enlarges the supply of money, which again, laws of supply and demand, with more money in circulation, the amount charged to borrow that money, interest, would go down. Another major alliance demand was something they called the sub-treasury plan. The sub-treasury plan was an innovative system that called for the federal government to build a network of warehouses and grain elevators all over the agricultural parts of the nation where at harvest time, farmers could come and deposit their crops temporarily, and the government would then issue them a low-cost government loan, 2% interest instead of 20 or 30 or 40. Um, this, of course, would, would, would require a major expansion of federal government. 
power. The Alliance called for a graduated in federal income tax, whereby the wealthy would pay a larger share of the nation's tax burden than the poor. They called for government ownership of the railroads. It, it was clear to Texans that, that uh, government regulation by means of a railroad commission had failed at that point. So they said the government should instead purchase the major railroad lines and operate them as a public utility in the as nonprofit pub, public utility in the interest of farmers. The argument being very much like our modern argument for say interstate highways that are paid for by taxpayer monies. Everyone profits from them, the, the country benefits from them, they should be paid for uh, by the people. They called for the direct election of U.S. senators. In those days, the, under, the, under the original U.S. Constitution, senators were elected by state legislators, state legislatures, uh, and with the, uh, with the influence of corporate money being so great on state legislatures, that led to the U.S. Senate sort of living up to that stereotype of that, of that cartoon we saw earlier, where the, where the monopolies and trusts and large corporations are pulling their strings. And finally, the Alliance called for uh, collective bargaining rights for organized labor. The right of, of, of labor unions to organize, to bargain for better wages, better working conditions, shorter hours, outlawing child labor, those sorts of things. Now, the Alliance had hoped that one or both of the major political parties, the Democrats and or the Republicans would adopt their platform, but neither party would do it. The expansion of government power envisioned by the Alliance program seemed downright un-American to many Americans. And Democrats and Republicans alike said that it would take the country down the dangerous path to socialism or worse. So when neither party would fight for them, the Alliance joined together with the nation's leading labor organization, the Knights of Labor, and created a new third party, which they called the People's Party. People were soon referring to members of the People's Party as populists, and the name stuck. The Alliance's demands became the Populist Party's platform. Over the next five years, the new party did all of the things that parties do. It, it recruited candidates, held nominating conventions, appealed to voters, tried to win elections. It spread from uh, it, it, Texas and Kansas and a few of its other birthplaces all over the nation. To further this, the, the, the goal of, of, uh, of succeeding in Texas the state's populists took the bold step of including African-Americans who still voted in large numbers in Texas in the 1890s in the party's leadership, and they actively courted the black vote. In its state level platforms, for example, the party promised equal per capita funding for black and white schools and more money for public education as a whole issues that appeal to black voters. It promised to reform the convict lease system, which disproportionate, this, this was the system whereby the state leased out its, its convicts to private industry or private, private uh, employers who, who disproportionately brutalized black prisoners. It proposed impressive efforts to prevent voter fraud of which black voters were a particular victim. So the appeal to Blacks and, and also Mexican-Americans in South Texas was, were really appeals based upon shared self-interests. By 1894, the People's Party had vastly surpa surpassed the Republicans to become the second leading party in Texas, in the two-party Texas system, behind the dominant Democrats. In both 1892 and 94, the party polled over 100,000 votes in Texas. Populists believed that they would finally triumph in 1896. 
But in that fateful year, as I'm sure many of you know, events at the national level proved to be the party's undoing. When the Democratic National Convention took the surprise step of nominating for president William, Democrat William Jennings Bryan, uh, who had endorsed several of the populist minor platform planks, the Populist National Convention decided, which is held two weeks later, decided to support the Democrat, Brian. They nominated him too, over the vehement protests of the, of the 102 Texas delegates to that convention. Populist voters in Texas and elsewhere were badly divided by the move. Some liked Brian and believing that the Democratic Party had been sufficiently populized, they returned to the Democratic Party. Many other populist voters believed that their national leaders had sold them out and they quit the party in disgust. Despite all this in the 1896 state elections, the Texas populist ticket polled 44% of the vote. But they lost and divided and disillusioned by that loss, the party quickly fell apart. By 1900, the populist movement was effectively over. But in the 20th century, many populist ideas lived on. In the progressive era, Teddy Roosevelt championed antitrust, anti-monopoly legislation, really taking up the populist fight against the, cor the big corporations. Under Woodrow Wilson, we saw the creation of the Federal Reserve System, which uh, incorporated some uh, of the populist monetary policy ideas, certainly gave the country a more flexible and expansive currency. Under uh, Wilson, we saw the direct election of senators and the progressive income tax become part of the Constitution. A generation later, under Franklin Roosevelt, New Deal programs like the AAA helped to improve farm prices and address problems of farm credit, echoing the populists' sub-treasury plan of old. Old populists who were still alive in, in the 1930s cheered when FDR took the U.S. partially off the gold standard in 1933. And finally, in the 1960s, the grandson of a prominent Texas populist a man named Sam Ely Johnson, the, the populist, finally made good on the populist promise of a liberal black-white coalition when that grandson of a populist, Lyndon Johnson, pushed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 through a reluctant Congress. Which brings us back to the essential question that I posed at the start of, of my talk, how did capitalism lead farmers to the reform movement known as populism? Well, I think the short answer is that Texas populists were among the first Americans to recognize that capitalism, while very good at creating wealth, also distributed the benefits of that wealth very unevenly, and they would say unfairly. Um, it produced an, un, an uneven playing field. Armed with the special privileges that go along with incorporation and the power that money can wield in politics, the new industrial order led to the exploitation of workers, the impoverishment of farmers, and the continued oppression of the powerless, including, of course, people of color. Populists pioneered the idea that certain widely shared public problems, problems created by the new industrial age, might require public solutions. That vision informed much of the country's political development in the 20th century, and I would argue that it shaped the political debates that continue to this day. And with that, I'll yield the floor.